himself has been successful in the show ring. Norma. Uh, nope, quite the contrary. Uh, the right dog is much more important than the amount of group wins or best varieties the dog acquires. Um, and I, I certainly think there are people who read to uh, a winning dog because they feel the puppies will sell better or something, but, um, and I, I, I think there are people like that. But we're definitely more interested in producing our ideal typical bull terriers we envision them and not concerned with how many ribbons or awards are collected. Um, I think Bar Sinister was a classic example of this. I mean, he never stepped into a show ring. Um, but having said that, I mean, we all know how much influence he had on the breed. So the awards and the wins are great. Uh, and like I said before, if you're lucky enough to be able to bring to a dog that is your ideal and what you want for a stud dog and a uh, winning dog, or what what can be better than that? Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. You need to look for the right dog, not the winning dog. Right, again. Uh, no. But although you would hope that a dog that has been successful in the show run would be of excellent type and have outstanding virtues, but that doesn't mean as a stud dog he will pass these on. Over the years, there have been many champions that have been used many times at stud and not really produced anything. So again, for us, it's more important to look at health, his lines, and if he's a bitch. Thank you. Um, I would agree. I mean, I think it's more about the dog, the, his record. There are so many things that he's going into, how much the dog has shown. And, think, and, and sometimes you're looking for a specific virtue, and that may not be the flavor that you're of what's going to win at the show ring, but that dog has got the virtue you're looking for. And for all the reasons we've been talking about, he's, he's the one that you decided to do. It would have no influence on us at all. Oh, we. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, are, we have 15 minutes left to take questions from the floor. So I'm sort of going to start down at the back of the room, sorry. I'm going to try to go quadrant to quadrant. Anybody in that back corner have a question with the panelists or one of the panelists? New? Anyway, yeah. One, we were talking about the mismarks earlier, and specifically on the whites. And I, you know, I've noticed going to all the shows that we all go to that there has been a tolerance for that. And, and the judges are really responsible in a way for what goes on. Because if you if you tolerate it and you put it up, people begin to feel that it's okay. And there's been more of it lately, and there have been some big winning dogs with mismarks that have gone up. Um, that's a comment. Number two, about I don't know how many years ago, Gerald Bell came and spoke to us. And he when he gave his talk, he talked to us on the co he talked about the coefficient of inbreeding in bull terriers. And it was very low, especially in the United States. And the recommendation he actually had was that we, we didn't breed we didn't when we talk about line breeding, we, we seem to talk about different things. And we, we don't do very tight line readings in general in this country. And so I was interested in what the panel what line breeding meant to them, and if you if you look at the pedigrees in the UK, for instance, they are much tighter, way way tighter than what we have here, and they they commonly breed close ancestors together. And I see extreme reluctance to do it here, and so I was just wondering what the panel thought about it. Anna, do you want to talk to them? Do you want to address that? <laughs> Would you have uh, because you're such a good sport? Part, part of that, yeah. um, Glenn, is um, once, the, well, certainly recently with the borders having opened up, that, um, how do you say this without getting into it? Um, oh, to get into it. <laughs> uh, People are now, it's like, oh man, the floodgates have opened. So there, nobody's interested in reading the Forget that. We're going out. 
but it, I mean, which is fine, and I think it's great. Is you know, sort of helped everybody in the world for this to happen. But people are doing it just randomly, just because they can, versus giving thought to, okay, what are we doing again? What are we doing with this? Where are we going? You know, are we bringing this back into to try and establish a line and go with that? Or just because it's there and it's available. Um, and we're so spread apart by comparison to the UK. So spread apart. So it's much easier for you guys to get around and see the dogs and know what you, I mean, and you've seen the generations behind them over and over, I'm over and over again, going to shows and visiting each other's kennels. This just never happens to us. I can, I can probably count on one hand the number of actual breeders that have ever been to our place you know 45 years what was that i didn't know what you said oh. <laughs> Dale and Chris, move closer no, it's true no, it's true but i mean i'm just saying you know and maybe people are i truly think they believe that um there's way better elsewhere and in some cases there is but you know, people need to sort of put some thought to how are they ever going to establish a line? Like, hello? I think we get oh, Yes, I think we get a lot of that because people are afraid to line breed because they hear a lot of pressure from the outside of oh, you're not line breeding, you're in breeding, and why yeah. would you? Ever, I mean, why would you ever think about breeding an uncle to a niece or you know? And in the, and some places like okay, they're trying to make that. Totally unregisterable. You know, if you breed a father to a daughter or whatever, you can't register those, and they're thinking about moving it to the next generation. And so when I talk to people that I sell puppies to, you know, they say, "Well, I get ready to the to breed." I say, "Well, you know, what about this?" They go, "Wow, isn't that kind of close? You know, don't you think we should go to some other dog from somewhere else?" So I think part of that is the education that we as breeders give to other people that. You know, you're not going to get a bunch of mutants. You're going to line breed for stamping, like you talked about, stamping on the qualities that you want into your line instead of just being this helter skelter of, gee, that dog looks great. The, uh, even the definitions of uh, line breeding and inbreeding are not finite. Uh, one goes into the other. Some people say that line breeding is a form of inbreeding, and perhaps indeed it is, but it is practice it in a way, if it's practiced in a way that you know what you're doing and you do use the, out, the judicious outcross, it's a very good way of going. Now, I, I'll say this and it'll, I'm sure there'll be retribution. So, you know, Just, yeah. somebody was saying that in uh, UK, there's not more line reading, and it is. Uh, Apparently so. And then if you look at our winners at the Silverwood and the specialty for a number of years back, and you'll find that the stud dogs are from Britain. Now then, I, I didn't have much to do with Raymond Oppenheimer, but I did go to his place several times because I had this buckskin <coughs> dog that he was all about. And uh, he said one of the things that he thought was wrong in, in this country was that people didn't like breed, they tended to go to the big winners. And he said, until that changes, the breed ain't going to move forward in that country. Now, I'm telling you, I'm not school, perhaps, but that is what he said. And so uh, I, I have always stuck with that. And I think it is, it, it scientifically makes sense. Well said. Okay, Phil, so you had your hand up? Well, I just had a comment. And I just think, why do we have to wait once a year to do this? This has been fabulous. Can I just ask a glad about the Miss Mark? In the UK, and I feel I think probably um, might work on this, you wouldn't win in the show ring with a Miss Mark dog. You've got a dog with a big mark on its side, we, you, you probably wouldn't see it in the show. Do you agree? Are you talking white? Yeah, it's a white show. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, a badly mark. Yeah, you, 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 you know, would not win. Smash, squash, from the back. Yes, yeah, but something, you know, especially a white with a big mark on its side or. 
There are two things that I, I can say about that is uh, that it is not supposed to be. And I think one of the things that we don't do over time is always pay attention to the standard. And the standard is specific about it. But on the other hand, Oppenheimer again said that doesn't matter at all. Carry on and do it. And he, I think, put it in the category of secondary defects. But then he has written about it and said to throw out a mismark is maybe about water going out. He was referring to breeding, probably, rather than yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but isn't, isn't that one of the things? Exactly. Yeah, I guess. Okay. I think it's all about showing. I have, a, I have a question about um, line reading in terms of going back. Okay. Now we're familiar with goats, and I know I know in goats that line reading. I mean, I have goats that show up 20 years later, and I see them coming through. How would you, if you've got a dog, say frozen, who's who? lived a long life and it's frozen and it's there, how would you consider bringing that forward in the future, or would you at all? Seeing that it had particular virtues that you still see carrying forward, but also particular faults that might pop up again that you've gotten rid of. And do you take that chance of bringing those virtues forward again, but potentially those faults again too? Did you see the faults also come forward, or did you, or you just took those with their, with the virtues that you saw come forward as well? Uh, we certainly saw, you know, some of the virtues come forward that we had hoped would, mm -hmm. and um, he was a dog that wasn't uh, used a lot, even though he was a trophy winner, mm -hmm. uh, very little, as a matter of fact. So, you know, that, that was delightful to get some of that back. There's no question about that. Um, sometimes it's uh, better to deal with the devil you know than one you don't. So, I mean, if you know the mind pretty intimately, we did, for sure. Um, guys, I'm very sorry, but the whispering is going to interfere with the, the audio pickup, so if everybody can, not everybody got the loud carrying volume. You want to tell her to stop? Because I'm not going to. I'm afraid of her. Andrea, actually, it was just a comment. You were saying about the, the coefficient. It's a lot. If you compare the UK, it's smaller than the size of California. So the US has a much larger gene pool than we have. Every show we go to, we're all pretty much at the same shows, whether it's the, the bottom of the country or the top of it. And so we have a much smaller gene pool. So our coefficient therefore is going to be a bit smaller, it tends to be because we have a smaller group of dogs to use. Whereas here, you can, I mean, here you're talking about that very few people come visit you. Here's, it's because of being so spread out. And obviously some, some breeders are gonna stay in, in local areas. And you're saying just recently, people are going further. But you know, that cuts both ways too, right? In, in, in the same way, I mean, I understand that. But it also cuts both ways because of the technology available, the world's also gotten smaller. And it's also a benefit because if you go and you breed to something that uh, you liked over in England, uh, you also can, I mean, you can use line bred animals in England it, to the line that you just bred in. I, it's not, um, but I don't, it's, I don't know. I, I mean, it's certainly possible to do. That's what you wanted. 
it's like everything else. It requires thought, it requires planning, and it requires learning from people who have, I, I mean, there's so many years of experience and so many litters of puppies and represented at this table. You know, part of what our job as the Breeders' Education Committee is, is to bring you answers to the questions that you have. I mean, I hope that this experience will get people in this club and people who are attending Silverwood to come to us, Bob, my all, Paula Greco, and myself, and say, listen, what you did with, with the panel on choosing a stud dog was great, but you know what I really want to know about? And bring us those questions, and we will do our best to find you people who aren't going to have all the answers. They're, they've got their own answers. They figured that out. But listening to what they have to say, learning from people who have who've tried, who, who've tripped and stumbled, who've had raging success. This is our function as a committee, is to bring you to a place where you can pick the brains of people who, who make mistakes. You don't want to make mistakes. Who've had enormous successes that you'd like to emulate. David, did I see you had a question? Yeah, just bring out an observation. That is the, the observations and the principles which the panel has enunciated are not new. This panel could have been presented 20 years ago and you would have come up with the same principles. The real test of a successful breeder is the implementation and the execution of those principles, and that's the hard part. Well, and it isn't just what happens in our breed. Um, I spend a lot of time people speaking with people in other breeds that have had great success. They all speak to the exact same principles, and it's a universal thing. And it's a really interesting exercise to um, go speak to breeders of different breeds, go look at what they're producing, and also of different stock. Because it, it, it all, we're all doing the same thing. And it, it helps your eye, it helps your mind, it gives you dimension, and uh, it gives you just a bigger feel and a, a bigger grasp, I think, to, to just leave our, our, own, our own breed and, and branch out. Yeah. Go to another table. And look around. Go to a couple of other tables. You know, everybody's speaking the same lingo. They're all out to do the same thing. Okay. I, I think one of the things that any of us who have been around for a while, we hear people who are maybe fairly new to the breed, or maybe somebody who doesn't breed a lot or go to a lot of dog shows, and, and their frustration with the fact that they don't think that they're being accorded the respect they think they deserve, they don't think they're being given the wins they think they deserve. And to give people an opportunity to understand what these people have put in in, way, in, the, in terms of blood, sweat, tears, months and weeks on their knees in welding boxes, this is what makes success. It's not a matter of waltzing in with a dog you bought over the internet and thinking that that means you're going to win. It's listening to people. You know, we're mentoring people who want to judge. We also are trying to mentor people who want to be successful breeders. And that breed success doesn't necessarily translate into the show ring, but it translates into respect for success proven over the years. Now I just got to say that the, the up and coming breeders, in order to avoid a lot of the accidents and pitfalls that have been almost the dog trip, just by talking to people that are successful. Uh, no. Learning to listen. Um, we're probably out of time, but I don't see anybody telling us to leave. So are there any more questions, questions from anybody? For the panel? I've got a question. <coughs>
Well, it's going back. I remember making some mistakes. Well, and hopefully, once you make a mistake, you learn how to not do that. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, this is Mr. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so very much for coming, and please a big round of applause.